Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Good morning, everybody. It is... Uh... It is good to see you at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. I'm going to ask if you would. Everybody just stand up for a second. Stand up for a second. We've got people still coming in. Maybe slide in a little bit so it's easier for those coming in to, to find a seat. Thank you for being here. I see a lot of guests with us. We're very glad that you're here worshiping with us today. We'd love for you to take the tear tab in your bulletin and put your name and contact information on it. That way we've got a record of your attendance and it would be my honor to reach out to you and check to see how your worship experience went today. A couple of quick reminders. A week from today is uh, our monthly breakfast hosted by Baptist Men. Uh, I want to thank all of you guys uh, on Friday and Saturday for showing up and helping with the, the hallway, the ceiling tiles. A lot of work got done and not all the way through with that, but thank you for coming out and helping with that. This upcoming Wednesday is a training for Awana, so there are no other activities other than Awana training this Wednesday. A week from this Wednesday, we'll kick back off with our regular fall programming on Wednesday nights with Awana and Adult Bible Study. A week from today is Move Up Sunday for our children's ministry. So if you're in elementary school, you will move up to your new class next Sunday. I'm sure many of you already know that, celebrated today. And you'll find in your worship guide uh, different women's ministry events and Bible studies that are also kicking off in the fall. And so you can find that information in your worship guide, see folks in the hallway you can also register online. And as I keep reminding you, if you want to know what goes on in the life of our church, get a beacon, a weekly newsletter, and we'll do our best to tell you all that's going on in the life of the church. Our call to worship scripture comes from Deuteronomy 15. A little bit of an odd text for call to worship, but it fits with our passage of scripture we're going to look at in a moment. This is God speaking through Moses uh, as his priest and prophet. Uh, it reads, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. If you say in your heart, how may we know that the word of the Lord has not spoken when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. Then the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you need not be afraid of him. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Let's sing now of his faithfulness as we sing the song, Always. I believe. I, I believe you give sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, but you are still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are stars in your hands That your goodness is good without end And you'll never change I will tell I will tell of your wonders And sing of your grace The God of creation knows you by name The Lord is faithful yesterday
If you would turn uh, your attention to the screens, we're going to look at our memory verse for the month of August, our last week as we've been walking through Elijah. This is a verse that kind of helps sum that up. If you're visiting with us, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Tad Craig. I'm the associate pastor here and also a staff elder. Uh, and I'm joy to get to know you more as you see me in the hallway at the end. Just come by and uh, say, hey, scripture, 1 Kings 18.37, read with me. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. It's a wonderful reminder of how God works in our lives, that he continues to bring us back to him, and we uh, accept and see that we are needing him and needing his glory more. Our Sunday school class of the week is the Blessed Believers. They meet at 930. If you've been coming just for the 11 o'clock service, uh, we invite you to join a Sunday school uh, class. There's lots that happen at 830. There's some that happen at 930. We've got Sunday school happening right now. So if you haven't found that community that you can learn more about uh, God's word and grow in scripture, if you could just find that place, you can start with Isla's, uh, the Blessed Believers. Isla Baum and Terry both teach that. You saw Terry up here leading us. Uh, he's also a Sunday school teacher, so we invite you to join us in Sunday school every week to grow more. Our prayer partner is the Ebenezer Children's Home. It's a wonderful partner. They help uh, kids that are in unfortunate events. Some have, uh, are looking for adoption through foster care. Uh, they partner with a lot of uh, organizations here in town. We've been partnering with Ebenezer for many years. One of our own, Ms. Sherry Reeves, is one of the directors out there, and she can help you uh, partner with them through monetary distribute or, or to work. We've had our high school and middle school students went out there and sorted clothes for them this summer. We've had Sunday school classes, throw birthday parties and Christmas parties and mission groups. All go out there and partner to help spread God's love to these to these children. So I hope that you'll plan on helping that and pray for them this week. And then we're also going to pray for our students and teachers. They go back to school tomorrow. And uh, I've seen a lot of teachers and talked to a lot of teachers, and they have asked for prayer because it's a new school year. I've looked across, and I see retired administrators and retired educators and teachers, and they are all smiling because they don't have a first day of school tomorrow. Uh, they may be rubbing in just a little bit. But let's pray for our teachers, pray for our administration and our students as they start back tomorrow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful for all the many blessings you give us. You continue to pour out blessings when we don't deserve them. That's why we come here and we want to lift up your name in praise. We want to worship you, share, uh, just get a glimpse of your glory, feel your presence, because your glory is enough. Your mercy, your grace is more than enough. And we need to continue to be reminded of that, that we come to you as a living sacrifice. We come putting ourselves at the door and just lift up to you and look to you for what we need to do to change our lives. And Father, I ask that you reveal that to us today. There are things going on that we each need to work through and to guide through, and we need to change. And I ask that you reveal that to us today. Help us as we continue to worship. Help us see uh, all the different things that we need to grow in you and be obedient to you. We pray for our Sunday school classes. We pray for the Blessed Believers class with Isla and Terry leading that class. Pray that you continue helping them grow in, in your word. Help them as they've had several health challenges throughout that class with family members. And we pray for peace and comfort and healing in those areas. Be with our prayer partner with the Ebenezer Children Home. We pray that you give them discernment and wisdom as they continue looking on how they can be um, a community and help this community to be a light into the dark world, to share the gospel to those that feel hopeless, that you are our hope. And Lord, we pray for our school system. We pray for the administrators and the teachers as they are preparing. They've spent the last couple of weeks looking forward to this day, but there's some anxiety that's surely happening because what they don't know what's going to happen there's new things new teachers some teachers retired lord i pray that you give them comfort be with our students as they are starting new give them the focus they need to start this year off right for we ask these things in your son's name amen amen thank you tad let's stand to continue to worship this morning the greatness and worthiness of our heavenly father Let's sing together. How great is our God? The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. 
majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. How great. to save. We're going to sing a song called Our God Saves. If I can get my guitar tuned, we'll sing it together. Here we go. All right. All right. Our God Saves. One, two, three, four. In the name of the Father. In the name of the, Father. In the, name of the Son. In the name of the Spirit. together to lift up your name to call on our Savior to fall on your grace in the name of the Father in the name of the Son in the name of the Spirit Lord we come we gather together to lift up your name Call on our Savior to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see. Yeah. 
Amen. He does save, and that is uh, why we're here today, to worship Him for His saving work in our lives. I'm going to ask if you would turn with me in your copy of Scripture to 1 Kings chapter 18. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, there should be one in the seat back in front of you. You're welcome to open it up and follow along. Um, I've entitled this morning's message, uh, The One True God. And uh, this is the text of Scripture that deals with the confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Um, this time of year is, uh, is my favorite time of year. And I know we're not at fall yet. It's been a false fall week, I think. But uh, the crisp, cool mornings, I love those. Love, the, love it when the leaves change color. And uh, it coincides with my favorite sport, which is college football season. Enjoy that. Uh, and, of course, uh, many of you are fans of college football teams, and we pull for our teams to win. And, unfortunately, only one team ends up on the top at the beginning sometime of next year. But we enjoy the season. We enjoy the games. We enjoy the moments when a team who is absolutely not supposed to win on paper finds a way to pull out a victory on a Saturday afternoon. It's fascinating, right, when, when a team that is just a complete underdog wins a matchup, Georgia Tech, right, against Florida State or something like that. A little more evenly matched, actually, on the field than on paper, but those kind of things take place. I'll be honest with you, 1 Kings 18 feels a little bit like an underdog matchup. Ahab and the kingdom of Israel were there on Mount Carmel. There were 450 prophets of Baal. There were 400 prophets of Asherah. Uh, they were on uh, Mount Carmel, which is a place that was known for Baal worship. And then there was one prophet of God who spoke to the people there and said, Hey, let's have a contest. Let's have a confrontation. It feels, if you read through the text in that scenario, it feels like Elijah was an underdog. But was he really? I mean, he was doing all this under the direction of God himself. Because God orchestrated the events of this scenario to show that he alone is God. I want you to read with me uh, 1 Kings 18, 20 through 40. And we're going to make three observations from this text uh, that point to the fact that our God, the God, is the one true God. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. They came near to all the people, and uh, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. It's kind of fascinating. He gave them an option, and they were absolutely silent. Crickets. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only am left of the uh, prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. You call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then the people spoke up. They answered, it's well spoken. I kind of put the prophets of Baal, I think, in a position where they had no choice but to accept that agreement. The people were in a, said, hey, this is a good idea. So here's what took place. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, verse 25, Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. So they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning till noon. That's from 9 a.m. Till 3, 3, 9 a.m. until noon. That's three hours. Saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he's musing or relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. As midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, that's three o'clock, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me, and all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. 
And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seas of seed. He put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. He said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. They seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Three observations about God being the one true God. The first one is observe the futility of idolatry and man-made religious practices. Elijah had set up this confrontation really at the direction of the Lord. We'll see that in a few moments. And he asked the question, how long will you people go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And so the setup was that they would both build altars, the prophets of Baal and Elijah, set up their altars, they would offer their sacrifices, they would lay it upon the altar, and they would pray to their God. And whichever God answered by fire was the God that was real. And so the prophets of Baal did that. They set up their altar, they cut their, their sacrifice, and then they began their rituals of Baal worship. And we need to see that idolatry is futile. It doesn't ever bring about anything that is real or that is certain. And here's why. Because we must see the futility of religious rituals. They prayed. They sang. They danced. They limped. They called on the name of their God. They did all of these things. And nothing happened. Their practices were futile. And over and over again in the text, the reason their practices were futile is because there was no God to hear. There's no deity to pay attention to the voices of the Baal worshipers. Because the rituals only matter if there's a God to hear and see and observe the rituals. But there was no God to hear and see and observe the rituals, so nothing took place. Folks, we live in a, a day and age, a very pluralistic day and age. By that I mean we live in a, in a culture where there are all sort of different religious expressions and ideologies and worldviews. We see that in our own community. We see that certainly in our country. Without question, we see that in the world. Uh, very different ideas and ideologies and practices and worship and rituals. There are folks who bow on their, on their face and they pray five times a day. And there, there are folks who offer sacrifices. And there are folks who do all sort of things in all sort of idolatrous ways. And then there are the secular ideologies where we kind of bow ourselves before technology or before other things, money and wealth and power and pleasure and all sort of things. And we practice different rituals that try to get us either fulfillment or get the attention of some deity or some uh, worldview or some power that we serve. But, but here's the reality. Those rituals are futile because there's no God behind those rituals to offer salvation and hope and forgiveness and peace and security. Prophets of Baal illustrate this. Not only do they illustrate this in the futility of their rituals, but we see the futility of their efforts. I mean, for three hours they prayed and they sang and they chanted and they worshipped. And some of you are saying, you know, uh, I'm glad the worship services at Wilkes for a Baptist church aren't three hours long. I just want to remind you, I'm here at 8 o'clock. And, and I'm here for three different services, not one service. But I've been to some services in Africa where three hours in, they're just getting going. And it is a blessed, freeing experience sometimes to not worry about all the other stuff going on. But, but three hours is a long time to do all this stuff and nothing happened. They did all this and they, nothing happened. And, and then you can hear the mockery and the sarcasm in Elijah's voice. Some Christians have wondered, is it okay to be sarcastic? Well, I don't know if it's okay to be sarcastic always. 
and I'm looking at teenagers right now. Uh, however, Elijah was sarcastic. I mean, you can read what he said. Hey, your God is a God. Maybe he's uh, musing, doing something fun. Maybe he's relieving himself. Use your imagination. It means what you think it means. Uh, maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's on a trip. Not there. He's not listening. Maybe you need to get a little louder. And so in, after his mockery, the prophets of Baal raised the level of intensity. They, they, they went from just praying and chanting to the word used is raving. They raved around. That is prophetic ecstasy. They, they went into another kind of level of prophetic uh, I- emphasis. They danced louder or danced bigger. They sang louder. They, they went further in their efforts to try to get the attention of their deity. Folks, efforts are futile if there's no God to see or to hear the efforts that are engaged in. Nothing happened. Notice, notice the words that are used as midday passed. They raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. By the way, at this point, that's six hours. They've been going on and on for six hours. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. The futility of their efforts. We also see the futility of their idolatrous uh, religious results. Ultimately, nothing took place. The, the prophets failed. Baal failed because Baal does not exist. It didn't happen. Nothing took place. It, even in their efforts, you notice that they cut themselves. They harmed themselves. They, they shed their blood as an attempt to try to get their God, their deity, to pay attention. Nothing took place. Here's why this is important for us to to grasp. Anything that we put in the place of the one true God is destined to fail. False gospels will never give us the results we long for because false gospels do not have at their root a God who is the one true God. They can't give you what they've promised. Whether those false gospels are religious, as in this case, or whether false gospels are philosophical, ideological, political, technological, whether they're based on addiction, pleasure, power, any false gospel that promises peace, nirvana, hope, fulfillment, if they don't have behind them a God who can keep a promise, then there's nothing that those false gospels will ever bring about except harm. I mean, I mean there are lots of people in our world that are doing things that are very in, full of intensity. Or they're doing things that that we can't question their sincerity. I know people who are part of other religious systems. They genuinely believe and they practice through effort and through intensity their religious expression. I don't question their, their sincerity. I don't question their effort. The problem is there's no God behind their sincerity and effort to answer their prayers. And ultimately, here's what happens. If we bend ourselves or bow ourselves before an idolatrous religious perspective, then we're going to come away harmed. Because false gospels don't give us what they promise. And ultimately, think about the prophets of Baal. They harmed themselves and nothing took place. Now, I I don't think at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, too many of us are in danger of bowing our knees to Baal or Asherah uh, in in the coming weeks. Our our temptations are not the, the false idols of days gone past. But we are in a culture that values technology sometimes to a, a, to a, a much too great degree. We think that sometimes technology will give us a measure of control over the world in which we live until some company or organization puts together an update that ends up closing down air travel for, you know, two days and, and locking down airports. And, and, you know, things like that remind us, I think, helpfully, we're not in charge. Technology is not in charge. Ultimately, if our hope is that things will be better because something's going to work quicker, I, I, and I'm not opposed to technology. Technology is a great tool, but it's a terrible master, and it's a terrible God, and it's a terrible deity. We need to remember, and this is good for us as God's people to gather and worship, we need to remember that we're not the ones in control. That our, 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 the things that we think are going to help us have a better life don't always fulfill the promise that they say they're going to make. Why? Because there's no real power behind it. Only God is real. And the futility is 
that idolatrous religious practice, whether it is a religion or whether it is some kind of philosophical or ideological component that we buy into in our, in our world, will always result in futility. So what do we do? What's our response? Well, Elijah models for us a different picture. If there's futility in idolatrous religious practices, the second observation is this, observe the faith of God's prophet. Elijah simply models faith. He prays. Notice the way he prays. Beautiful prayer. He says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel... Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant, that I've done all these things at your word. So in order for us to have faith, we need to have faith in God's word. How do we build up our faith? How do we exercise our faith muscles? Well, we do what Elijah did. You remember back in chapter 17, Elijah prayed that it would not rain. Why did he pray that it wouldn't rain? Because God had promised in the Old Testament, that if the people of Israel bought into idolatry, that he would not send rain as a means of judgment. In other words, Elijah's prophetic utterance and his prayer about that was at God's word. Do you realize that he went and hid at Cherith because God's word told him to? And he went from Cherith to Zarephath at God's word, and he left Zarephath to uh, go speak to Ahab at God's word. And when he got to Ahab and said, here's what we're going to do, it was also at God's word. In other words, Elijah's faith was deepened by his understanding of what God had said and his belief in what God had spoken through his word. If you want to build your faith up, God doesn't say that we need miraculous events and miracles to deepen uh, our faith. We need his word. It's a means and a mechanism that every single one of us has access to. So if we want to know the God of Elijah, then we need to read about the God of Elijah that's found in the pages of Scripture. We need to deepen our level of faith based on what God's Word teaches us. We also need faith expressed through God-ordained religious practices. Elijah did some things that would be uh, described as religious practices in the text. There on Mount Carmel, there were uh, all kind of high places built for Baal worship, but the altar that was there for the people of God had been broken down. So what did Elijah do? He built it back up. He took 12 stones. He made an altar there. He, he did all of the ritual uh, aspects of preparing a sacrifice. He did all of those things ritually and practice, practically in order to be able to worship God. And God gloriously invites us to know him through expressed means of worshiping him and praising him. God's not against ritual, and God's not against means. Here's what the Bible is very clear about. It's beautifully mysterious, but it's wonderful. God is the one that invites us to know him on his terms, not on our terms. See, sometimes we get that mixed up. We think that, okay, if I do enough things religiously which is exactly like the the, uh, idolaters did. If we practice the right rituals and we do so with enough effort and intensity, then God is sure to give us his attention. Well, that's not the Bible at all. The Bible never, never puts it in that order. The Bible says that God has given us his attention because he loves us and cares for us and wants us to know him and invites us into a relationship with him. And in a relationship with him, then guess what? How do we deepen our faith? Through the practices that God has prescribed. Do you know why God promises to meet us in worship? Because God wants us to know him and he wants us to experience him. When we gather as God's people, he promises to be in our midst. He promises to inhabit the praises of his people. He promises to be with us in his word and be with us in prayer. And all of the practices that you and I have an opportunity to engage in. He promises that in the ordinance of baptism... He will show his glory and goodness as a picture of the redemptive work that he's done. He promises through the ordinance of the table that as we gather as his people and we celebrate that he's present in that event. Why? He's ordained the practices. Means aren't the problem. It's just we don't do the means to get to God. We do the means because God's already with us. And it's a way for us to worship him. So one of the greatest ways that we can build up our faith is regularly practicing our faith in the prescriptions that God's already given us in His Word. So we need faith expressed through God-ordained religious practices. Thirdly, we need faith exhibited in prayer. In prayer. So God's Word, practices, and prayer. 
And that's what Elijah did. He prayed. Elijah is a man of prayer. We've noted that. He prayed at the outset of his ministry. He prayed when, when the widow's son was raised. I'm quite sure he spent a lot of time in meditation and prayer while he was a Cherith and Seraphath. We see in the next paragraph, what we'll look at next week, that he prayed consistently. He prayed with perseverance. He prayed in conversations with God. I mean, Elijah is a picture and a model of what it looks like for us to pray. In the text here, though, he prayed for two verses. It wasn't a long prayer. He didn't spend hours in prayer. The, the, the prophets of Baal chanted and danced in all their efforts for six hours. Elijah prayed two verses. Now, uh, they were uh, pretty big two verses. And, and think about this for just a second. As Elijah put the, put the altar together, and as he put water on the altar, and some are asking, well, where did they get water from? Well, Mount Carmel was not, the, the range was not but a couple of miles from the Mediterranean Sea on one side or the river Kishon on the other side. And depending on where this particular confrontation took place, it might have even been closer to one or the other. And so it wouldn't, not a problem at all to have water accessed to be able to pour water on the altar. It wouldn't matter if it was salt water or if it was fresh water. I personally like to think that the people who did the, uh, who went to t get the water jars happened to be some of the prophets that Obadiah had rescued earlier in the chapter. I think maybe they heard about the confrontation and they said, I want to be there for that. And they showed up in kind of the congregation of the people of Israel. And they're wondering what's going to take place in this confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And when Elijah said, hey, we need some water from the ocean, I can imagine some of those prophets volunteering and saying, I'll do that. So they did that four times. They poured it over the, over the altar there. It ran down into the trench. All of that was taking place. And, and so Elijah was at the, the moment of decision. The water had soaked the altar. The sacrifice was soaked. The prophets of Baal had obviously failed. But let's not forget, the, the congregation of the people of Israel are there. Ahab, the king, is there. The prophets of Baal are there. And there's one prophet. At least one pro public prophet. There might have been others there supportive of Elijah. He's it. There's nobody else standing with him. He, he doesn't have an army behind, behind, beside him. He knows that if God doesn't come through in this moment, it's probably his neck on the line. I mean, there, there's no getting away from this contingent of folks. And so what does he do? He prays. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Simple straightforward, maybe a little bit desperate, but certainly full of faith. Let me say something to you folks. The greatest way as a Christian we can exhibit our faith is in prayer. You know why that's the case? Because when we pray truly and when we pray underneath the authority of God, we're exhibiting our need. See, the hero of this story isn't Elijah. He prayed and he did, he did the stuff to get the altar together. But the hero of the story is God himself, who, who rained down fire to uh, lick up the altar, to burn it down. That's the third observation that we see. Observe the faithfulness of the one true God. So we've got the faith of the prophet, the futility of the idol worshipers, and then we've got the faithfulness of God who really is. We know he is the one true God because he orchestrated the events of the confrontation. This was God's idea. Remember, I, I've done all these things at your word, Elijah said. This was God's plan. God's plan was to orchestrate this event to show that he is the one true God. And, and, and you know what God did? He did so in a way that truly shows his glory. Mount Carmel was a place where the prophets of Baal had worshipped Baal for years. This was a place that was known to them. It was a place where they regularly worshipped. It's as if God was saying, I'll go to your home field. You can have home field advantage. This is your home court. We will have the confrontation where everything sets up in your favor. And even the event itself, the confronting power, there's a relief in the ancient world that shows the god Baal holding a lightning bolt in very similar fashion to the way the Greek god Zeus is portrayed as holding a lightning bolt because he's the god of the storms. So even the confrontation is, if Baal's really the god of the storms, 
you know, sending a lightning bolt down to, to, uh, to, to cause fire on a, an altar should not be that big of a deal for a God who controls the lightning. So the entire orchestration of the, of the setup and the confrontation was in God's mind on the home turf of Baal and his prophets. In their scenario, the best possibility that Baal could succeed. In crickets. No God answered because no God exists. What does that tell us about God? Well, one thing it tells us is that God doesn't have a handicap. There's no place that isn't a home field advantage to the one true God. We may think in our world that it looks like a lost cause, whether it's another part of the world. One of the reasons we pray for unreached people groups monthly at our church is because we don't believe they're out of the reach of the one true God. Because our God saves And there is no limitation on his ability and location to save. Sometimes we think, man, we'll be be really safe if we're in a place that we're comfortable and we're controlled. And and everything's good. And I'm not sure I'm going to go on a mission trip because, you know, mission trip, that's a little scary. And even the last mission trip, Wilkesboro Baptist Church went on. Man, they they got there and they had to spend a few days in Miami. Man, I, I would be scared about doing that. I've got to get on a plane. And we think, you know, is it really safe? Let me tell you something. God owns all of the places in our world. Home turf is whatever God has made. The point is that God saves and redeems and rescues wherever he chooses. He's the one who orchestrated the events of this entire confrontation and scenario. He's one that we can trust no matter what. There's no qualification on the place or the location of God's power and God's ability to rescue. We know that he is God because he orchestrated the events of this confrontation. We also know that he's God because he answered by fire. I love verse 38. It's one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible for about a thousand reasons. One, it's staggering. Listen to it. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. Okay, consumed the offering. If you go back in in, in read your judges, you'll find that God's done this before. He's burned up an offering on an altar before. That's happened. But notice what else happens. He burned the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water in the trench. In other words, at the end of Elijah's prayer, when God answered, there's a, there's a burnt piece of ground, on, and that's all that's left. Folks, wet wood doesn't burn. doesn't happen. I've tried to do that before. You can put gasoline on wet wood, and gasoline burns, and the wood stays wet, and it doesn't go anywhere. There was nothing left. God answered by fire. But here's one of the reasons I love this verse. Because it is so matter of fact. This is one of the ways we know that God's word is true. He doesn't dramatize it. This isn't built up in some kind of, you know, scenario. I mean, if, if, I'm, I'm going to go off script for just a second. You're watching a movie. You realize that, that the music behind the scenes on the movie sets up the drama. Turn the, turn the mute button on the music uh, of a movie. And a lot of times it takes away the fear or the anxiety of the scene because the, 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 the music behind it is setting that up. In other words, there's dramatic effect. That's intentional. In, in filmmaking and in other scenes, there's, that's not present in verse 38. It's not there. You know why? God does not have to dramatize his glory and his miracles. It's matter of fact. It's straightforward. Why is it matter of fact and straightforward? Because it's just what happened. They just wrote it down. This is what God did. He answered by fire. It shows that he's glorious. It's, it's consistent with his character too, by the way. God answered a request by fire with Abraham. He did so in the book of Judges. If you look back at the book of, in the book of Exodus, how did God speak to Moses at a burning bush through fire? He led the people of Israel out of Egypt through a pillar of fire. It's also true in the New Testament. John the Baptist said of Jesus, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Acts chapter 2, the... Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, and they spoke with tongues of fire. Hebrews uh, chapter 10, our God is a consuming fire. In other words, the scripture under, underscores this reality that God speaks by fire. And we know that he's God because he spoke this way in the text. He answered Elijah's prayer. 
Thirdly, we know that this is the one true God because he is faithful to judge. Our God will judge between the right and the wrong, the religious and the irreligious, the wicked and the idolatrous, the faithful and those who don't believe. Look at verse 40. Elijah said, seize the prophets, don't let any escape. They seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook at Kishon and slaughtered them there. That's a troubling verse. I get that. None of us would want to be a part of that slaughter, that, that, uh, that act of judgment. But the reason that was there, it's part of the reason for the call to worship text. The reason that false prophets were judged with death in the Old Testament is because they were leading the people of God astray. It was affecting their eternities. God will not stand for those to draw people away forever. I mean, the, the false prophets were leading people to trust in a God who wasn't there, which meant they were condemning their souls to eternal damnation. Sometimes we, we're troubled with this text, and should we preside over the death of others, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not trying to get you to be... I'm not preaching a sermon about the, uh, whether capital punishment is right or is wrong or anything like that. We read that, and we're troubled with it, and, and that kind of thing. But here's the reality. Every single one of us in this room believes that a criminal who is evil and sinful ought to be justly punished for their crimes, right? I mean, if someone takes someone else's life, there ought to be some form of punishment. They ought not just get off with that. Maybe they should be uh, face capital punishment. Maybe they should face life in prison. But in the religious context and the theocracy that was present in, in, uh, in Israel at this time, it was the job of the king and the leaders of the people of Israel not to tolerate false prophets. Because it meant that God was being argued against, that, that God was not being worshipped and that people were being led astray to their eternal damnation. And so the judgment was right. It was right because there were folks that were leading the people of Israel away to their soul's demise. And so it was Ahab's job actually to put out these prophets, to kill these prophets. But he didn't do it, so Elijah did that. It tells us that God judges that God is the rightful one who one day will separate us like the sheep are separated from the goats in Matthew 25 and say, you're a part of the righteous and you're a part of the unrighteous. God judges. In, in some ways, this text of Scripture ends on a less than pleasant note. It shows a confrontation that God is right and righteous and holy and full of judgment. But I think in this text, there's more than a hint of God's redemptive plan. And what he wants to do. See, it, there's, a, there's a word that's used a couple of times that I started wrestling with and studying over uh, in the text that, that shows God's redemptive work in the passage of Scripture. It's the word limp. It's an odd word. It's not used very often in Scripture. It's used uh, first when Elijah says, Why will you go limping between two different opinions? You know, if God is God, worship Him. If Baal is God, worship Him. It carries with it this idea of going back and forth. In a moment, you, you think God is the Lord. In another moment, you think Baal is the Lord. And so there's a back and forth motion to that, that comment. It's used again, same words used, when, when the prophets of Baal were limping around the altar. It's used in cultic worship. It carries with it the idea of kind of dancing and chanting and, and bending over as a means to get the attention of the deity to whom you serve. But as I got to doing some studying on that word, trying to figure out what, what its context was here in this passage of Scripture, this word in its root form is used in a couple of other places in the Old Testament. Interestingly, the place it's used is in Exodus chapter 13, and the word in that context is the word Passover. It's the same word used when God said, I'm going to ask the people of Israel to slaughter lambs and I'm going to tell them to put the blood on the doorpost and I will pass over the blood on the doorpost. Not judging the people of Israel because the sacrifice has covered their sin and their unrighteousness. In other words, the redemptive picture or the redemptive foreshadowing that's found in the text is that God himself has provided a way for our sins to be forgiven and for our unrighteousness to be cleansed. We can't do it on our own, but God has done that. He's done that in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. See, here's where so many of us are. We're like the people of Israel that hear that comment for the first time. We're limping between two different opinions. We're going back and forth. 
You're here this morning, worship service on Sunday morning, you heard some beautiful music, you sang some music with us, you've heard a sermon, and you're thinking, okay, I know who the one true God is, I'm going to worship Him, I'm going to serve Him, I'm going to surrender my life to Him, I, I am with you right now. And, and you've probably been there before on a Sunday morning, maybe been there before during the week, but, but here's our tendency, our temptation is to, to hold that wholeheartedly in the moment. And then before too long, in the day or in the week, we go right back to the other idolatrous patterns of our behavior. And when we do that, we feel really bad. We, we feel like, man, I've messed it, I've blown it, I've blown it, I've sinned against God. You know what we do when we sin against God and we've blown it? Sometimes we observe exactly what the prophets of Baal did. You know why they limped around their altar? Because they were trying to get the attention of their God. You know how many Christians I've talked to over the years who have who've recognized they've sinned, they've watched something they shouldn't watch, listened to something they shouldn't listen to, they've been bound back up in some kind of uh, idolatry or some kind of addictive behavior, and they, they, they truly, genuinely believe in God, but they're bound up in some sin. And you know what they do? They, they, they limp. They go back to God and they say, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I sinned against you. I'll do better. I'll do better today. I'll do better the next time. I, I, I ask your forgiveness. I'm sorry. They limp around. You know, that is futile. It will never work, ever work. Because God does not accept us based on our efforts and based on our, uh, based on our own strength. The only way God accepts us is by Him passing over our sinfulness. And while God will not accept our limping, God did accept the Passover provision of His own Son some 900 years later. I want you to think about this for a second. I really think in some ways Jesus limped His way to the cross. You remember He was beaten, He was bruised, He was bloodied, and He had a, a, a piece of, of wooden cross on His shoulders that His blood was already soaking into and the text tells us that he limped his way to Mount Calvary. Listen, here in this event on Mount Carmel, Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal with a water-soaked altar and belief in the one true God. But on Mount Calvary, Jesus confronted the powers of the world with a blood-soaked cross and faith in the one true God. And he brought about the opportunity for us to experience redemption. Here at, at, at Carmel, the prophets of Baal limped their way around the altar and they cut themselves and they mutilated themselves trying to get the attention of their God. Unlike the prophets of Baal, Jesus' cuts and bruises came not from self-mutilation, but from the whips and the thorns and the nails and the beatings of the religious and political powers of the day. Unlike the prophets of Baal and unlike the waffling Israelites, Jesus limping had nothing to do with indecision or, uh, or was about religious ritual rather Jesus limping was exactly like the Passover in the book of Exodus. He took our place. He performed the rituals that we couldn't possibly hope to do righteously. And he did so by putting his blood on a cross that allows our sins to be passed over. And allows us to experience redemption and forgiveness and life. Here's why this matters. There's going to come a day when every single one of us is going to stand before the only God who ever has existed. And we're either going to be in the situation of the prophets of Baal, and we have lived our lives futilely seeking after idolatry and things that will never last. And if that's been our lives, then we will be resigned to God's judgment forever. Others of us are going to be in the audience, the congregation. We never really made a decision. We didn't really want to buy an idolatry, but we really didn't want to follow God either. The only ones of us that will make it into eternal life are those whose sins have been passed over because we've trusted in Jesus' own death on the cross and his opportunity that he offers us to receive forgiveness. Maybe you're here this morning. And you've been back and forth, limping between two different opinions. It's time to stop limping, and it's time to come to Christ and realize He's already done that for you. It's time to start waff stop waffling back and forth. It's time to stop your idolatry. 
Would you turn from your sins? Would you turn from your futile practices? Would you trust in Jesus alone? Would you recognize that he has paid your sin debt, that he has offered you redemption, that he has provided so that you can be forgiven? I'd love nothing more than to talk to you about how you can do that, if that's your situation. Christian, I want you to remember this. Jesus has already done what you could not. The reason we have faith in him is because he's the God who answers by fire. And he's the God who shed his blood so that our sins could be passed over. Our faith is in the God who always wins these confrontations and always will. Stand with me, if you will. God, teach us to trust you. Help us as your people to see your glory and your goodness and your word and to follow you by faith. I pray for the one or several that are here this morning that are continuing to waffle back and forth, trying to do their own thing, trying to win their own life, trying to solve their own problems. I pray, Heavenly Father, that they would come to you in faith and in repentance and trust in you alone. And I pray for the ones in the room that are trying by ritual and effort and practice and all sort of other things to earn your blessing. Lord, help them to see that your blessing has already been given through the death of your Son, our Savior, on the cross. Help them to trust in you and not trust in themselves. God, teach us to depend on you in faith. Thank you for the sacrifice, Lord Jesus, that you made to give us life and to give us forgiveness and give us the opportunity to spend forever with you. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to trust and follow you. pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at wilkesborobaptist.org. Again, thank you for worshiping with us.